So my name is Fiona Duthie, and up until last week, I was president of Felt Butcher Canada. But at our AGM, we had a change of board as I needed to step down and move into some other projects. But I am here to showcase this work for you tonight and introduce this amazing group of artists who are all exhibiting work in this show. Um, it is a show of our membership, and we are a national organization and have members all across the country. Um, and many of them were present at our symposium last week, which was fantastic to get to meet so many people from across the whole country. And many of our provinces are represented in the work that you'll see in the show. Um, we put out a call for shrine, and the idea was it would be something that everyone could find some touch point to relate to. Um, our first point of um, thinking about shrine is in terms of religion, but of course, it's really about icons and what is most important to you, what you value, and um, something that you want to revere. And so that was the nature of the call for entry we put out to our members. And people really delved right into that concept and made very personal work that has incredible stories related to it. So we're gonna relate some of those tonight, but also, in the um, exhibition catalogs we have in the gallery. There's a couple of exhibition copies and there are also copies for sale. All of the makers and artist stories are in, those, in that catalog. And so if you have the time, I encourage you to take the catalog and walk around with it because the pieces are visually interesting and very diverse, but it's when you read the stories that you can see where people, where, what, what people explored both inwardly and outwardly in creating these pieces. We have three aspects of presentation for you tonight, um, which I think we're very lucky to be able to do. Uh, while we were at our symposium in Nova Scotia, we were able to record just short video clips of the makers and artists who were present there, just talking a little bit about their pieces. So you'll see some of those. And we also have, I think, four or five of the artists present tonight so when you see your work, just come forward and just talk a little bit about your piece, okay? And lastly, there are p members who, pieces that are not present, and so we'll, you'll see their work and I'll just read um, a, a few words that they sent in. Not so much from the artist catalog, but just more reflections, their own personal reflections about the piece. Okay, so we'll see those three different elements um, representing the work. So our first piece is from June Jacobs in Saskatchewan, and we asked her, how do you feel about the theme on first reading? And she responded by saying, I love a challenge. I participate in theme exhibitions on a regular basis, and in fact, I offer theme exhibitions to artists that I represent in my gallery, the Handwave Gallery. The theme for this exhibition found me as I was working on another piece for a different exhibition. I was working with lilac wood at the time. It felt like a natural transition. I looked at integration of materials and what works best for the piece while reflecting on the symbolism of the shrine elements. Most works I create have a basis in human personal experiences that have a greater societal connection and context. Scale was my only hesitation for this piece. I have some reservations about the size and feel that it would have more impact on a larger scale, which I'll pursue further. So June Jacobs is in Saskatchewan. Our next artist is Lois McDonald Layden, who we met up with in Nova Scotia, and she's from New Brunswick. Could you tell me the story of your piece, please? Great. So when I uh, read about the theme shrine, I instantly knew it would be somehow connected to nature, because nature is definitely where I get inspired, where I find peace and meaning in life. It's where I get... Um, energy and um, it's where I, it, it's my religious practice if I have one. It's definitely in nature, walking by the ocean or trees or um, I feel really close to whatever our origin is, whatever you might think that is. So I knew instantly it would be um, something about nature and then I started thinking about how the multimedia bit was very um, uh, the thing that challenged me the most because I, I technically don't usually do multimedia um, 
But then I thought about how I could incorporate that. So that's why the idea of the rune stones uh, made of clay came from. Um, they they are all inscribed with different little uh, symbols of religious practices and beliefs. And um, some idea was that if you're in nature, whatever your beliefs are, you can find something that will uh, speak to you. And, and we all give different names to probably the same general thing. Did you make the rune stones? Yes, yeah. There, I w did want to make them out of wood initially. I thought it would be really cool to have nice polished little stone-shaped things. Um, but then I, I started doing that and I realized I'm not a woodworker. So, <laughs> so I, I'm like, okay, that's not going to work because I only gave myself uh, two days, I, I was trying, <laughs> trying to squeeze it in and I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to learn how to wood, woodwork and have the tools in the two days it will take me to, to do that. So then I switched to polymer clay, which, which kind of worked well too because it's natural materials and, and something that's not so natural, pretending to be natural, yeah. which sort of uh, speaks to how when we start to label beliefs and religious practices and organize religion, it becomes less about the, the meaning of it and more about the surface. I think it's really interesting to hear her words um, and the way that she reflected on both the materials and the theme and also her accent. And it makes you appreciate how uh, the span of the participants in this exhibition is quite lovely. And now we have Diane Goosens, who's here with us tonight from British Columbia. So, Diane, if you could just come over to here and just tell us the story about your work. Okay, great. Um, my piece is called Hold Deer. I grew up on a farm in southwestern Ontario. Um, my grandfather bought it in the 40s, my dad farmed it, and my brother farmed it. And it's the place that all of us as family uh, congregate. And uh, the farm is, has quite a large uh, farmyard uh, to it. And in that farmyard are three trees that my aunt, who would have been, who would be over 100 now, planted when she was just a, t a teenager, these small saplings. And they're now, um, I don't know, 75 feet high. At, and they grow kind of unencumbered in the backyard of uh, the farm. And so when, uh, I started to think about what is it that I hold dear as a shrine. It really is that idea of um, family, um, extended family, and a rural way of life, um, particularly when we're starting to move to more of an industrialized, urbanized um, existence. And I think about how important it is to maintain that farmland to maintain that way of life um, from a nourishment uh, point of view. And that tree really represents that for me of uh, how it has um, grown, it provides shade, it provides shelter for birds and insects. And it's something that I always connect to when I uh, go back to the farm. So I chose to uh, do a uh, hat that was very papal-like. Uh, with the tree being the center of it. It's actually a snapshot that my brother-in-law, who's a photographer, took, and then I transferred it onto silk. And then uh, the jacket I chose to put with it has little seed pockets in it, as you'll see um, if you travel across the street. And that in it, I've uh, put fir cones and pine cones and uh, nuts that I've collected both from the farm in southwestern Ontario and um, here in British Columbia as well. It's, so it's something that grounds me uh, in, terms of, in terms of what I hold dear uh, in my life. That's great, thank you, Diane. <laughs> and our next piece is uh, Needle Felted Work by Connie Michelle Morey. She has told us, you know, she tends to think very broadly about systems and the way the world is put together. It's the way my mind works. When I first saw the theme shrine, I immediately thought of values, social values and traditions. Textile traditions like felt have existed as a domestically gendered and overlooked art form. My work taste explores questions of what we value and what we consider to be in good taste. 
It is in a sense a shrine of gender and domesticity. And Connie Mori is based in Victoria, BC. And our next piece is by Kimberly Tucker from Ontario. This is actually an interactive piece. And so it starts off like this, but she invites the viewer to hold the pieces or move the pieces or change the compositions so that there's a, an interaction and a relationship that you develop with the work. I readily identify with the theme, theme shrine. In fact, if I really think about it, I have several in my home. The box of china from my grandmother, the wall of old family photos, my father's toolbox. I often incorporate found or discarded objects into my felted sculptures as a way of paying homage to a person through an item or belonging and the stories and memories attached to it. And so responding to shrine seemed a natural extension of my practice. I love the ability of felt to envelop and cocoon an object. It has this nurturing and comforting feeling, and at the same time for me as a metaphor for nature. During the creation of this piece, I struggled with its simplicity because it wasn't in keeping as ornate or as colorful as any traditional shrine I've ever seen. But in the end, I'm pleased I let the process unfold and happen because the piece is true to my inspiration. So this is a piece, like I said, we encourage you to go across the road and work with a little bit, touch it, um, because under all of these, there are embedded pieces of um, vintage jewelry. And it, it's an interesting concept and an interesting piece. This is actually my piece for in the show. Um, it is wool and um, jum, uh, using jumchi, um, traditional Korean paper making techniques. So it's actually got paper felted directly into the wool. Um, I've also used um, sumi e ink, which is a type of soot ink. So there's a whole relationship here with our, um, the, the, sort of our creative fire. It's a shrine to that, to, to our creative fires. And I liked the aspect particularly in relation to the burning in that you know, we, we have this burning desire to create. We can't help ourselves. It's something we have to do. But I was also aware, especially during the time of making this, how easy it is to go too far and become burnt out. <laughs> but the soot-based the soot ink uh, was an interesting material to work with. Um, it's very simple and bold, but in engaging in our creative practices, we also need to have that kind of boldness and um, um, confidence, like to take a, a, on a finished felt piece like this, the sumi ink and create those ink marks. It takes a moment, a deep breath, and a sort of act of faith that it's all going to work. But that's often the step we take in our creative practices as well in developing new work. So the aspect of the burning was um, really important to me in this piece. And so in the, in the actual piece in the gallery, it's also mounted on charred wood, burnt wood, because we knew the gallery walls were white and the white on white wouldn't show as well. But it actually takes the piece even further by having not only the fire element and the shrine element, but the soot from the, that the ink is created from, and then this burnt wood as the, as the base. And now we have Jennifer Suchida from Ontario giving us a little talk. Can you tell me the story of your piece, please? Sure. My piece is about self-love and um, self-respect. So you can't love others if you don't love yourself first. You have to, the love has to come from within. It has to be at your core. And my piece is a tactile homage to self. Can you tell me about some of the things you used to make it? Sure. Um, it's Nuno felted as well as sculptural felted. So I've used various silks and I have an affinity for polka dots and because it's a, it's a shrine to self, um, I thought I would represent myself uh, by using polka dots. I'm very known for my dots and even my stripes. Um, I've also incorporated uh, a picture of myself on the head that's between the lips. So with a shrine, you always have a central figure that you're kind of praying to. And I thought, well, the central figure in my shrine would be lips kissing my head. <laughs> so it's kind of like self-love, it represents self-love. It's kind of like a play on words without the words. And um, this piece here I, is a torso. 
and I just thought it would add some interest to my piece because these rep are representative of lungs and then these are the ribs. And then um, the ribs attached to this torso are hugging the lungs. And it's kind of like um, giving, embracing yourself from within and embracing your uniqueness. One thing that's quite incredible about felt work and current, right, especially today's felt work is we can create just about anything. You know, we can create felt flat work, we can create sculptural pieces, we can build in all kinds of texture, and it's such a remarkable medium to get to work with. And you can start to see some of the diversity in the work as we go through these um, slides. So now we have Diane Chris from Alberta. And Diane wrote to us saying, at its core, transfiguration is about honoring the act of picking up the pieces and reshaping a new normal, one that can find joy, beauty, and hope within traumatic, unexpected circumstances. In my shrine, the five irregular, colorful forms represent this transformation. They were formed in a completely random way when I dove into my bin of scraps and literally pulled up random handfuls that combined rovings, textile trimmings, yarn ends, etc. Already in my grip, a new form was emerging. I then solidified it using needle felting. It was important for me to have the process authentically reflect the concept of broken parts and unpredictability fusing together to create something anew. Diane does really bold, colorful work, sculptural work that combines um, felting, mostly needle felting, with traditional rug hooking. So it's, it's quite dynamic, her pieces. And now we have Christiana Ferguson from Ontario. She has a very interesting story about her, her piece. Can you tell me the story of your piece, please? Sure, so this uh, piece is called St. Marilyn. It's inspired uh, by a friend of mine who I always said when I met her, uh, it completely changed my idea of what it was to, to age and to get older. And uh, Marilyn, she was a painter and an artist and she loved to travel and uh, was a great community builder in the village where I live. So she passed away a couple years ago. So this piece is, is about Marilyn, but it is also about uh, the idea of aging and, and how to age well. Well, I actually was wondering if Marilyn, what would Marilyn think of it? Uh, <laughs> so having a shrine devoted to Yeah, her. well, a, a, a friend mentioned that she thought she would think it was ridiculous, the idea of being called St. Marilyn. <laughs> but I think she would get a kick out of it. And uh, I think she'd love this idea that her image was traveling across the country because she was such a traveler and loved to meet people from all over the place. I think she would uh, get a kick out of it. Uh, so after the piece was completed, kind of one of the fun things that came out of it was uh, I posted a picture on social media, as one does. And because I live in a small community, a lot of people started commenting who were also very touched by Marilyn and were friends with her. And next thing I knew, there was like a whole gathering plan to see the shrine off to Nova Scotia. So um, someone approached the person who now lives in Marilyn's old house and said, you know, can we come and, and have a send off? And they said, yes. Yeah. So a group of, small group of us gathered and everyone brought something that reminded them of Marilyn and uh, we set the shrine up and went around and everyone shared stories. Some people read poetry that they had written about her and oh. it was really a really beautiful uh, send off. So to me, it just speaks to the power of uh, art and community and um, yeah, it's given me tons of gifts doing this. That's quite a beautiful story, the way a piece like this can draw a whole community together. Um, and also makes, just makes people think of it, you know, about an important topic. Um, we actually have three awards that are associated with this exhibition. And uh, Chris's piece was awarded by a, a group of international felt makers who were present at our symposium, the um, Dying House Gallery Sculptural Felt Art Award for this year. And now we have Faye Hodson from Alberta. And she wrote to us saying, on first hearing about the shrine theme, I honestly wasn't too sure. I come from an iconoclastic religious background, and as I became an adult, shifted towards thinking in terms of evolution and scientific methodology. Consequently, I have little familiarity with shrines. But when I started to think about them being places of contemplation and reflection, an idea started to form. I've been saving a baggie full of plastic beach debris from a trip to Kauai, 
knowing that someday a project would come along that lets me express my concern about what we are naively doing to the environments we celebrate. I've been creating Im imaginary sea creatures and installations for a few years and wanted to push my sculpting skills with armatures and felt. These things came together and a sea shrine was born. It was all a bit of an evolving process in terms of researching, designing, and using techniques that are new to me. I'm particularly pleased with the subtlety and prettiness of the labyrinth path and its intrinsic aesthetic contrast with the fact that it is made out of plastic garbage. And we have Carmen LaFerriere, who's here with us tonight. <laughs> so, Carmen, if you can just tell us a little bit about the story behind your work. Yes. Um, and, yeah. First, uh, it's called uh, Un Le Geste au Quotidien, which means um, daily actions that are often unnoticed, just like women working with their hands, handwork. You see women doing it, but you don't point to it or stare at it. So I took a chance to reflect upon that with this shrine sort of, it just brought me to this inner reflection about what I love to do with uh, wool and having the opportunity to um, uh, use another medium was also interesting because it pushed my creativity a bit further so I used a bit of a uh, plaster of Paris, um, what do you call it, um, a bust mm -hmm. that I had made previously and I cut it off to fit the box, <laughs> the sizes. Uh, it was a little difficult to, to fit everything in the box, but it did fit. I even added that little stool here, <laughs> which was part of a handwork that my dad used to do on a little wooden bench that was uh, anyhow, so all the little pieces you see on it is a um, technique called borrow. It's stitching. So I spent my summer stitching on it, and I carried my little apron everywhere, and I really started to like it. <laughs> I really, really uh, uh, had a chance to reflect. and uh, As well, my piece has an inside the back of the back of it is it's filled with um, little pieces of uh, linen that are, have been uh, mended over and over by my mother. And they all hang, hung with a little, you know those little bra hooks? <laughs> yeah. Well, I stitched those and I, I found a big roll this summer <laughs> in a secondhand shop. So I, I like the idea of just stitching them and hanging them mm -hmm. and writing reflections of what these women might have been thinking when they're working, hard working. So that's, it was a lovely theme. I really enjoyed it. Oh, that's good. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Carmen. <laughs> Car Carmen's piece is beautifully detailed. And I, when you go over to the gallery, you'll see the extent of the detail in the back. But it's worth taking some time to look that over. And now we have Sheila Thompson from Ontario. So could you tell me the story of your piece, please? Uh, sure. Um, I was thinking in the summer in Toronto, there was a lot of crazy going on, a lot of anger and uh, bad politicians and uh, just the world seemed like an uncertain, hostile place. So what I wanted to do was create three related pieces that were about strength were strong places. That would be places where people could go to be optimistic and self-determination would be strong and resilience would be built. So that's really the idea between uh, these, about these pieces is that there's three separate spaces where you can feel that you're building your strength. Nice. Uh, um, and it, those places could be your home they could be a spiritual place, uh, they could be the woods, they could be any of those kinds of places, uh, uh, lying on the grass in the forest, being calm somehow. And so that's what I wanted to convey with this piece, was uh, that sense of uh, a journey. You'll see that they, they kind of linked with a, a silk rope, they have a bit of a journey through uh, the top one being, um, 
it's kind of a two lives sort of sense. There's a bit of Nuno felting in the top that is uh, a past life. Uh, regular felting in the, in the second half of the piece is the present. And then you go through into the middle piece here, which links, um, I was doing a bit of virtual you know, linkage to my website, which links to a number of what I hope are inspirational kind of quotes from people to say that failure is in fact a good thing, that you know, failure can, can make you more resilient, can make you be more excited about what's coming. Uh, there's a particularly good one by H Hannah Gadsby saying there's nothing um, stronger than a broken woman who rebuilds herself. Those kind of things is what I hope people will take away from um, <laughs> looking at this thing. Oh my, so it's, it, these are, it's not shown here, obviously, but you can go to this tiny little QR code if you have all sorts of technical capabilities with your small book and go to that place and to get, I hope, read some kind of inspiring things. So that was sort of the second piece. This last, uh, this last bit is, um, I don't know, it's, it's about the night. And the night can be such a kind of uh, calm time. And there's tiny little candles in this uh, second, uh, this third piece. And I made the candles by taking my mother's thimble collection mm. and making the tiny candle holders inside her thimbles. <laughs> and then using little tea lights and, you know, trying to pour in, uh. <laughs> to pour in the candle without it being a big mess, right? So. That I think uh, these little these little circles here are imagining the candle light. I could light them, but then the whole thing might go on fire. But but you know you're imagining the candles burning, and and sort of showing you the way, and it being a very calm and sort of peaceful evening uh, where you can see the stars and kind of you know recover for the next day. So that's really what the piece is about. That's beautiful. Thank you. I just wanted to point out kind of this, these commonalities, you know, that we're seeing in a lot of, when we, as we hear people talking, that there is this idea of um, personal exploration and depth, like people really, really invested themselves into the ideas in these pieces. Um, and also, uh, while it's a bit of an unusual, or, well, I was going to say too that, you know, there's so much, that, there's often a lot of connection to home um, in some way or another, home or generations or history. Um, and personal histories, and that's an interesting reflection on the idea of a shrine as well. Um, one of the things I'd wanted to say about this um, was just that, I know this is a bit of an unusual presentation, but as a group show, we wanted you to have a chance to really hear the, each individual maker's and artist's voice, because um, you know, we, I could just talk about the work in general, but now you actually get to hear what each person, how they reflected on the pieces. And this felt like a, a good way to be able to share that with you. And Chantal Cardinal is our next artist, and she's here with us tonight. She's based here in Vancouver. So my piece is called Complementaries, and basically it's, yes, about the colors, which is orange and blue, but mainly um, my shrine is, is the place I go to to meditate and, and be happy, which is my studio. So basically, my process is is where I go to to deal with things and to think about things and to fix things, and it's actually the only time that your my mind can be quiet. So I don't know if anybody here is familiar with rolling and felting, but um, that's meditative to me, and that's where um, magic happens is when you're actually doing the repetitive motions and the the ordinary but that's when the extraordinary comes out. So this piece is just a moment in time in my studio. Unfortunately, I was having health, health issues and this piece helped me get through that. So we were working on a shrine and we needed to um, work with a different medium. And I am in a studio that has um, uh, somebody that works plaster, which was just here, but she just left. And, and that was an excuse to actually play in her medium. So plaster and felt have a great symbiotic uh, relationship where when the plaster warms up, it actually uh, grabs onto the felt. And that was a really nice excuse to, to go there and to see what would happen. And this is the first of probably many pieces of plaster and felt that's going to come out of my studio. 
And yeah, so I'm hoping this is not um, a, necessarily a story that has, uh, like everybody, ha a, a personal story, but it was very, at that time, um, very therapeutic for me to work on my little shrine here. Thank you, Chantal. <laughs> Our membership is made up primarily of Canadians living in Canada, but we also are open to Canadians who live overseas. And Marjolaine Arsenault is one such member. She uh, grew up in the Gaspésie and now lives in Upper New York State. Uh, when the invitation came out about uh, creating a piece for the shrine exhibit and the theme of the exhibit, I really sat with that for quite a while. Um, and it brought me back to a trip I had just done two years ago with my sister uh, traveling to Bali. And shrines, these little shrines were everywhere. Uh, every store you went to, any, every taxi driver had this beautiful little shrine uh, on their dashboard uh, or on the, in front of their house. And um, it made me aware that for me, I wasn't, um, I wasn't honoring something or something outside of me, but for me it was all within me. And that the divine and what I was honoring was really within my heart. And uh, so I was sitting with that and really trying to think how am I going to represent this in a piece? And uh, the show had limitations in terms of dimension and how it had to fit in a box and all this. So I was really inspired to create a, a garment representation. Uh, my passion in the felting is to create garments. So I love to make clothing, seamless clothing. Uh, this piece I wanted to go to a step beyond what I normally make and to create a piece that would have uh, the three dimension, a little bit something more uh, dimensional to it. And uh, by making the garment be a representation of the soul. So creating, uh, the, not the soul, but I want to say more the... Um, the essence? The a vessel, sorry. So it, the garment becomes the vessel of the soul. So it's a garment, but it's also the vessel of the soul, and the, the heart is really the representation of the connection between uh, the human body and the divine. So it's our connection in the body of something that's so much bigger than, than us, so much bigger than ourself, and it connects us to something really, really big. and. Um, so then the theme of the heart opening the garment, opening the vessel to really uh, display the heart um, came to life in this piece. And um, the usage of the second medium, uh, the using the copper, uh, seemed to be very natural because copper is all about uh, energy. So it's a conduit of energy. And for me, the piece is all about energy. So it's about light, it's about uh, um, radiating love from the heart. So you have the small spiral of copper radiating, that light radiating the love, and you also have an energy uh, coming out, of the, coming out of, the, of the heart as light. And that's where the piece uh, having the effect of the energy going up and then going down and then swirling all the way around from the heart. Uh, so that's how the story came to be on this piece. Now we have Sandra Barrett, who's also from British Columbia. I was inspired because last year we had a disaster in Fernie, BC. Three men were killed in the, the arena when there was an ammonia leak. And I went to this pop-up shrine that was outside the city hall and people left flowers 
even though it was October the 17th and frosty and they knew they were going to die from the cold, but still they left them and I was compelled to come and read what was written on the, on the bouquets. And um, as it happened, CBC were there and I was interviewed for national television and it was surreal because you couldn't walk round over Weighty, the, well it's safe on food stuff, mm -hmm. I keep saying over Weighty. Um, you couldn't walk around the supermarket without people talking to each other because it's such a small community and even if you didn't know the people in person, you knew their families and it had such an impact, that shrine, although it disappeared after a mm -hmm. short time, um, it was my starting point because it was so compelling that people felt just like when Princess Diana died, mm -hmm. they felt they had to leave some sort of token. And so I knew I wanted to make something from metal because that's my trade, I'm a blacksmith. And so I wanted to encapsulate the metal with felt. So I made a resistance, slip the felt over the metal and we had dimensions to follow. So I knew it had to be 14 inches tall by 10 inches by 8 inches and I followed those and then gradually as I started working on it so more ideas came to me and then I remembered the copper doors I made and left behind in Britain when I was newly qual qualified as a blacksmith and because it's my design mm -hmm. um, and it's my church that I left them in uh -huh. um, I wanted them to be part of the shrine so they the miniature copper doors, well, not exactly a replica. <laughs> um, and so that idea came to me as I was making the doors, or the day before I was making the doors. And um, so it was done in different stages. The, the arch was my first premise, because to me that's the, the sort of niche where the shrine goes. I knew I wanted to replicate my face in thermoformable felt. And that's really hard because I hadn't done it before, but I hadn't made a bronze casting of my face before. Oh. So I used the bronze as the basis, draped the felt over it, and put it in the oven to cook. <laughs> <laughs> and that experiment worked. So that's my face inside. And um, I'd just been on a wearable technology workshop and I wanted to incorporate lights and so I had to learn how to unsolder the lights so that just the eyes lit up oh. and then around um, different parts it lights up and I didn't know if it was relevant but um, sometimes you just got to do what you want to do and um, it's hard because it can be seen as kitschy but there it is, I've incorporated it. <laughs> and Sandra's piece, as you'll see, is the piece we've been using as our main piece in the catalog and also in some of our promotion materials. She's incorporated a lot of different techniques in her, in her piece. Now we have Debbie Katz, who's also from British Columbia. And she said, I immediately love the theme of the exhibition Shrine. It evokes images of sanctuary, silence, caves, darkness, hiding, safety, all these images floated through my head for weeks. All winter, I'd been listening to music that continued to bring me back to memories of long ago. I'd been talking with friends I hadn't heard from in so many years. I'd been reading about memories and the place they have in our lives. Within the next few days, I was able to bring together the elements of my shrine, Memory House. Using painted deer antlers to protect the soft felted bowl filled with beach stones, the memories now enshrined. In creating the piece, I was able to collaborate with a friend who is a painter, her studio was a marvelous place to choose and work with the colors I used in my piece. Strong red, black, and turquoise stripes on the antlers echoed on the long winding red felted rope that holds the memory house beneath the antlers. Something very powerful had taken place in the months that it took to bring the piece to completion. For me, this piece evokes a place so far away from this techno-strewn world. It truly is a sanctuary, a shrine to the memories of the lives we have lived. And now we have Lisa Hagaratz, who is also here with us all the way from Nova Scotia. She's, 
She's just flown in this, today, this today. very day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could just tell us the story of your piece. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think as with everybody, the idea of shrine to me was a place or an object where you focus your energies of something that, that is dear to you. And um, the idea of felting to me was very feminine. So I wanted to explore the idea of femininity. And then with my Catholic background, I had the idea of a triptych similar to the, the piece we just saw. But I wanted, and the, the idea of threes is very powerful, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I wanted to turn that, flip that over. So um, with the feminine, and, but also rather than doing making it a vertical triptych as opposed to a horizontal triptych. <coughs> so we have three elements. Um, <coughs> another idea of shrine for me is uh, beach walking. And so there's incorporated throughout is driftwood. And finding the perfect pieces of driftwood was a joy because I got to beach comb. So I incorporated the idea of feminine artistic um, energy with iconic female artists from North America. Three countries, but all the same continent. Uh, I really love skulls and bones that I find on the beach. So I wanted to create my first sculptural piece. I started by trying to do a bird skull, but it was beyond my capabilities, all the really fine bones and stuff. So then I went to the idea of a cow skull and through that, once it was created, realized this is very George O'Keefe, and then decided on specific female artists. Um, so we have the George O'Keefe piece, which is Memento Mori as well, we reflecting on death. We have uh, the red cedar, the heart of the forest in uh, the Emily Carr piece, which is more two-dimensional, and uh, Frida Kahlo at the top. So head, heart, and hand. Um, and the female creative spirit. That's beautiful, thank you. And our last piece we're looking at tonight is from um, Tina Sharapova from New Brunswick. And she said, when I first read the theme, it seemed to be thrilling. How would a felted piece show the idea of shrine? Building a little house was too obvious, so I started thinking, what else can serve as a container for sacred objects, thoughts, ideas? I remembered the saying, your body is a temple, your body is a shrine, treat it as precious, pointing to the fact that we all carry a spark of divine energy as a part of the universe. That is why I made a garment protecting the sacred body. To make it stronger, stronger I used leather belts and copper buckles enriching softness of the wool and creating the contrast in this piece. This vest, resembling ancient armor, was not just a regular piece of clothing, but it took some effort to develop the pattern and the closures. Labyrinth patterns on front and back symbolize life as a journey, beautiful and dangerous. The finished piece looks soft and flexible, but is also strong and durable. I would like to incorporate some details from this piece inspired by this piece into my next work, adding more leather and metal pieces and bringing more diversity to the felted texture. And Tina's piece also won one of our awards. I'm stepping down, have stepped down as president and in my transition have also now sponsored the Wearable Art Award for our organization and this will continue on into future years. So our group of international jurors selected her work to be awarded this prize. Oh, and we have one more piece, which was our other award winner, which is not part of the BC exhibition. There were s about 10 pieces that were part of the Nova Scotia exhibition. All of this work has just traveled from Nova Scotia to BC two days ago in our luggage. Um, and this piece was on show in Nova Scotia. It's not part of the BC show. But I wanted to include it here because it did win the Ashford Harmonique two-dimensional felt art award for this year by Ayami Strick, who is based in BC as well. So this gives you an overview of the pieces in the show and some of the voices of the artists. 
We're going to go over to the gallery just now, and we'll have a chance for some questions and answers, or for you to talk to the different artists who are present and ask any questions, take a look at the exhibition catalog. And so we do hope you'll join us over in the other building just for some time to look at these pieces in real life, because it's so, so very different to see them in person than to see them on the screen. Thank you, everybody.